Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'll allow just a couple more minutes for folks to wander in. I know these days of virtual meetings that uh, takes a while sometimes to shift from one to the other, but we will get started in just a couple minutes. Thank you. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We're at the top of the hour, and I'm very excited to be able to kick off. Uh, we're joined today by a special guest, uh, my fam from the Institute for Exceptional Care, uh, which we're very proud to note uh, that IEC is now a member of the Linux Foundation Public Health, uh, and we're thrilled to be able to have her and the organization's participation. Uh, one of our goals as part of LFPH is to expand our membership beyond just the traditional technical stakeholders, but also those representing critical aspects of the industry and the health ecosystem overall. And, and my and the organization bring, I think, a tremendously valuable focus, especially personally as, as someone whose family has been involved with uh, exceptional care um, uh, in the educational setting, um, that uh, bringing stakeholders such as my and, and IEC um, help give a direct insights into um, business process flows, organizational challenges, technical challenges that we can assimilate as part of developing open source and digital public goods to address these challenges. So with that, Mai, I am thrilled to introduce you and turn it over to you to start your presentation for today. Thanks very much, Jim, and thanks for having me. Um, so we realize that this is a coming from a, a source and about a population that may not be familiar to all of you. So we'll take you through some basic context setting and then um, tell you about one specific area of work that we think intersects really well with the Linux Foundation. Um, so IEC is a relatively young nonprofit focused on transforming healthcare for people with IDD. And IDD stands for intellectual and or developmental disabilities. So conditions like Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, fetal alcohol syndrome. These are lifelong conditions. They um, are usually uh, congenital or appear in childhood and last throughout the lifespan. And we know that in this healthcare system, which serves us neurotypical people, um, okay, not great, um, that it can be even more challenging and uh, even unsafe for people with IDD. So what is the current state? You know, if you're someone with IDD, it is not unusual to have a new problem occur, to go through the usual healthcare doors looking for a primary care physician, um, but then finding that that physician is wholly unprepared to serve you because they don't understand IDD. They've never received any training in it. Um, as a result of their feeling underconfident, they may not treat you well, or they may be misdiagnosis or mistesting. Um, and then you feel isolated, you might get bounced to a specialist or two. Uh, your family care partners might need to take more time off from work to take you to new appointments. The specialists don't know much more than the PCP did. And time passes by, um, you're frustrated, a lot of resources uh, and energy have gone into seeking solutions for a problem that hasn't been solved, right? That's current state. And where we want to get to is a world where when someone with IDD has a clinical issue and they walk through any healthcare door, they find someone who is prepared to one, welcome them, and two, understand their needs, and three, even if that provider can't meet all of their needs, to know how to get them to the resources that can support them. And that that is done within an ecosystem where insurers, um, and, P and the, the entities like government and employers paying for healthcare are all part of um, the coordination of services and supports. So what are the challenges that stand between us and that new reality? Well, one, as I mentioned, clinicians um, hold outdated views 
about IDD, and very few of them receive appropriate training. There is this widespread misperception, as even I had as a general internist, as a national health policy leader, and as the mother of an autistic son, I still had the misperception that this is a small niche population, that uh, it's not our problem as generalists, we need to send them to IDD specialists. The vast majority of doctors believe that quality of care is lower for people with IDD, and this is important because it plays into decisions such as happened during the early days of the COVID pandemic when hospitals were deprioritizing people with IDD when allocating resources like ICU beds or ventilator support. The majority of physicians are not confident they can give quality care to people with disabilities generally. And you may not know, but even within the world of disabilities, there's a hierarchy. People who are blind or who have physical disabilities tend to engender more positive responses. And way at the bottom are people who are deaf or who have IDD. And it's not surprising that this is the reality because very few clinicians are actually trained in IDD care or even be, being told what IDD is. Medical students get an average of 11 minutes of exposure during their training years. I know that I received exactly zero. The reality is it's not a niche. Now, people offer different numbers around prevalence, but we believe that our estimates are conservative in using um, slightly old prevalence data and just projecting forward to current US population numbers. But we peg it as somewhere between 10 and 16 million, depending on whether you include learning disabilities and um, ADHD in that bucket. And for perspective, 8% of Americans have diabetes. So this is not a niche issue. And if you think about all of the family care partners who are affected, who may have um, more mental health stress, more physical health problems, um, more uh, spousal relationship problems, because they are trying to care for someone with IDD, the implications of IDD conditions multiplies. In addition, people are living longer. So Down syndrome and dementia didn't used to be a thing. And now it's a real issue that AARP has to grapple with. The costs of care are high. Now this $350 billion in annual spend um, is inclusive of clinical care, non-clinical services like education and housing, and also lost workplace employment participation by people with IDD who could work if they had the right supports, and by family care partners who, again, could be more productive with less absenteeism and not dropping out of the workforce if they and their families were getting sufficient support. Contrary to popular belief, most people with IDD are not on Medicaid or social security insurance. Most of them are privately insured, either through their own employers or through their parents. And there is a lot of stress, as I said, on all involved. As a result, we're not surprised to discover that people with IDD have significantly worse health and life outcomes than people without IDD. Higher rates of chronic conditions like obesity, diabetes, higher rates of unemployment, extremely high suicide rates, which for me as a mother is particularly anxiety provoking um, because this is especially true for young adults who are autistic. You may be surprised to know that other than age, intellectual disability is the strongest predictor of COVID death. And it is the strongest predictor of COVID infection, period. And then again, not surprisingly, but dishearteningly, the intersection of IDD with race, ethnicity, with living in rural areas, with poverty, um, produces even worse health outcomes. So IAC launched as a collaboration of a group of healthcare leaders who also have the lived experience of caring for an affected loved one. And our goal is to get to a place where people with IDD have better health and better lives through three focus areas of work. One is paying for better care. A second is taking the burden of care coordination off of patients and families and put it, putting it on well-prepared professionals where it belongs. And the third is training more capable and caring clinicians. We're gonna focus on this first gear here, the paying for better care today. 
So I'm a payment expert. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, and um, really, if you needed me to create a payment structure for healthcare providers, give me half an hour in a dark closet. It's not that hard. But it's impossible if I don't have the requisite tools. And those tools include data that is complete and accurate, knowing what outcomes you want me to pay for, right? And having the ability to predict what services a person needs, which involves data, but also a model and a, an analytic model and a framework for thinking about that. The reality is in the IDD field, all of these things are missing. So IEC is trying to build technical tools in order to get to a place where we can design better payment. So we're gonna focus and zero in on the data challenge today. And the main, one of the main data challenges, there are many data challenges, but the most foundational one is frankly that IDD is invisible. People with IDD are very poorly labeled in healthcare data, be that electronic chart data or insurance claims. And this is probably a multifactorial problem, a lack of clinical awareness, as we talked about, um, it actually takes meaningful resources to do the neuropsychological testing that you need to form a diagnosis, and those resources are scarce. Many clinicians miss either diagnosing or documenting co-occurring IDD conditions. It is not, not uncommon to have autism and intellectual disability, or it, autism and ADHD, or cerebral palsy and intellectual disability. If you're only coding for one of those, you're again, not seeing the whole person or the whole picture. Um, adults in particular with IDD, because of the stigma and the negative re reactions that they often get from clinical providers may not self-disclose. When you transition from childhood where diagnosis and documentation tends to be a little bit better to adult care, often that medical history doesn't travel well. And it's much harder and less common to get repeat neuropsychological testing as an adult. So there's this huge chasm. When we looked at um, electronic clinical chart data from EPIC, for example, going from the age cohort of 16 to 18 to the immediate next cohort of 19 to 21, there was a 60% drop off in the ostensible prevalence rate of IDD. That is not biology driven. And then not least, um, there is no particular payment incentive to document IDD with the exception of some Medicaid contexts. So, you know, if someone has heart failure or someone has um, a recent hospitalization for uh, lung disease, there is a payment incentive to document those because that might increase the payments that you get um, from the insurer. It's not the case for IDD. So how much are we undercounting IDD? No one actually knows. These are just our estimates based on very preliminary unpublished data. But the ostensible prevalence in claims that we saw from one national insurer and an EMR data from EPIC is um, somewhere on the order of 10 to 25% of what one would expect based on CDC prevalence data and surveys. Right? And there are certain subgroups that are at higher risk of being undercounted adults for reasons we talked about, uh, females, especially for the autistic population, females tend to be um, diagnosed at much lower rates than males. And that is beginning, that gap is beginning to close over time. Black, brown, poor, and rural populations are less likely to be documented, um, starting with the fact that they are less likely to have access to the testing and specialist resources to make that diagnosis. And then those with less visible features, right? So if you have Down syndrome, you have a particular face, facies um, is the clinical term, typical kind of facial um, makeup, you, that's very visible. If you have cerebral palsy, that may be very visible. If you're autistic, not necessarily, um, or fetal alcohol syndrome, not necessarily. The reality is, if you can't see someone, you can't address their problems, if you can't see all of them. And as a result of IDD being invisible, payers don't prioritize the population. Clinicians continue to believe that they are a niche um, population. 
it makes it really hard to measure quality of care, spending, and disparities, um, and to address those things. It makes it hard to create a rational business case for better investment or better payment for services. We live with so many missed opportunities to understand the connections between IDD and bad health outcomes and avoidable use of healthcare services. So, um, you know, IDD is not unrelated to mental health um, visits to the emergency department, for example. But if you don't know that person has IDD and you're an insurer looking at your claims data, you don't have the full explanation for the use patterns that you're seeing. And not least, IDD being invisible makes it hard to target interventions to improve outcomes because you don't know where you're aiming. So it's kind of like a surgeon amputating limb after limb without knowing that diabetes exists and that it can cause um, gangrene, right? So what's the solution? This is a problem, this problem of underdocumentation. This is a problem that has happened before to many marginalized um, groups, um, like people with HIV. Uh, back in the day when I was a medical student, uh, depression was grossly undercoded for lots of reasons, including stigma. And there's a known path to solving the problem. Traditionally, it has involved um, engaging clinicians, raising their awareness, putting out guidelines that tell them how to look for the condition, how to diagnose it, what to document, and, uh, and then offering them incentives. That's a well-trodden path and it has worked for other conditions. It's also extremely resource intensive and can take many, many years, if not a generation or two. And that's for conditions where people are getting trained, right? Um, every medical student got training in HIV. Every resident understands or has to understand how to diagnose depression. IDD is starting from a place that is much farther behind. You can also think about investing in national data collection as a number of major agencies are doing. Um, surveys, uh, prevalence monitoring, all of that is really important and it supports public health decision-making. It supports uh, population analysis but it's not particularly helpful for day-to-day decision-making, either in the clinical realm or in the insurance realm. So what's the alternative? We think it is to create a proxy for actual documented conditions. And that break makes us to how we want to make IDD visible um, through a tool that we're dubbing EIDD. And the goal here is to create a machine learning tool that more comprehensively identifies children and adults with IDD using typical healthcare data, but partnered with a vast array of social economic data, because we do not believe that the clinical data alone will solve this problem. This is a partnership with um, some pretty uh, uh, well-established institutions that you see listed here. Um, and uh, we are hoping to get funding from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research um, uh, Institute, which is a federally funded nonprofit um, focused on, among other things, IDD. So you all, many of you are far more expert than I am in data science, and so you will recognize some of these technical challenges and opportunities. One major challenge is picking a gold standard for defining IDD to teach the algorithm. Um, because we can't look for it. We can't rely on just healthcare data to tell us that. We actually have to comb through the charts and look at multiple pieces of information um, and sometimes read between the lines. We have developed criteria, the gold standard criteria, um, but, you know, but that's a challenge. You then have to be able to access a large pool of known IDD cases. And we believe that we have managed that with the partners that we've selected. You have to invest in pretty resource intensive chart reviews. Um, you have to build case scenarios to coach the algorithm. So you don't want the algorithm just looking for patterns uh, de novo. You want to make sure that there's space validity in what it, what it looks for um, and what it recognizes. So for example, a pretty common clinical scenario is a teenager who's not thriving 
and doesn't have any known physical problems. That increases the risk for IBD. Um, similarly, you know, uh, a young adult who's unemployed, has mental health issues, has trouble uh, with social relationships, may not be diagnosed even, but has increased risk of IDD. We want to make the most of EMR and billing data, but as I said, recognize their limitations uh, and leveraging. And when I say rich socioeconomic data, I mean um, over 400 um, primary data points, including everything from mortgage debt to home ownership to where a person lives, whether there are parks nearby, um, internet search affinity terms, et cetera. And then using a federated learning platform to allow access to multiple sources of data at once. We do worry about the potential unintended consequences of taking this route. Um, we certainly don't want such an algorithm to propagate current disparities in diagnosis and documentation. That's why we chose the clinical partners that we did, because Montefiore uh, Medical Center in the Bronx, Duke University in North Carolina, and Long Island Select Healthcare serve respectively high numbers of Black and Brown people, rural populations, and adults with IDD. And knowing that those subgroups are at particular risk for being undocumented, we wanted to make sure that the algorithm represented them fairly. We're also always worried that use of this algorithm may paradoxically expose patients to bias and harm, in addition to having the potential to reduce bias and harm. And so we want to be very deliberate in the way that we roll this out in any pilots or practical applications. Um, and some, you know, relatedly, um, the algorithm is not intended to be used all on its own, except perhaps for research purposes. When it's used in the clinical context, we would want that clinical team to confirm the diagnosis. We also worry about ethical challenges. Um, as I said, and we've talked about fairly representing at-risk groups, we also want to make sure that stakeholders um, who are important to us in this endeavor, so people with IDD and family care partners in particular, that they understand the power and the pitfalls of using machine learning and use of the proxy labels, that we don't just um, get superficial input from them. And as the next bullet implies, that their priorities and perspectives are front and center as we go about identifying clinical scenarios, as we, um, as we work through development of the algorithm itself and look at preliminary data. And then we would want to conduct an external validation in a whole new population and pilot this algorithm before allowing its broad use. Um, I know that open access issues are very important to, to um, the Lennox Foundation. And so we wanted to have that conversation with you. Uh, this is a new endeavor to us. We definitely want this algorithm to be broadly used in the industry. The reality though, is that because of the reliance on social economic data, which is um, you know, affordable, but not free, and that needs to be linked on a person level, um, on an individual level to clinical data um, for the algorithm to run, that implies a certain cost. And it also implies um, you know, careful data governance to ensure privacy. Uh, and so those are things that we have to think through as we think about what access means. Um, you know, we're, we're likely gonna have to charge fees at least to cover the costs and also um, think smartly about how to optimize access um, in a way that makes sense for the industry. So for sure, for example, um, you know, the, the top of the pyramid would be researchers because the more researchers use the algorithm, the more we will all learn. Um, but we would also want to make this as accessible as possible for government and nonprofit users. Um, and we have not formed policies yet in any of this regard. So we just love your um, commentary and advice and input on all of that.
that's it for my remarks. Um, and I would love to open it up to Jim and all of you for a conversation. Fantastic, thank you, Mai. And we'll wait to see if a couple of questions flow in. Um, I would start off by asking, obviously we talked about the open algorithm as one. Um, I'm involved quite a bit with HL7 and the different standards development efforts for fast health information resources, FHIR, and, uh, and of course its relationship to electronic health records. Do you think that that's an area that perhaps is under addressed as well, just the standards for data and what clinicians should enter and how that information is shared? I do, because unfortunately, a lot of the relevant information for IDD right now lives in unstructured data fields, um, and that's a problem. And we are also concerned, and we've tried to talk to um, uh, ONC and HHS about this, we're concerned that as data standards evolve, for example, to take into account so, uh, social drivers of health or functional status, that there's too much of a focus on just the frail elderly population um, and not broad enough an appreciation that you should be asking these things with um, both acquired and uh, congenital disabilities in mind. And I, I guess I'd follow up on that from my personal experience. Sometimes the challenge becomes uh, clinical, inter clinical interface versus psychiatric interface, psychiatric referral, clinicians thinking this is a psychiatric issue and not a clinical related issue and, and dealing with that in the context of what data they should capture and where and how being a challenge. Yeah, and to which I, to one, I completely agree. Two, I would um, again underscore that that's a gross misperception. And three, you know, when we talk to clinicians about this and we try to frame shift for them, what we say is it's a lot like diabetes. Diabetes, the reason that every clinician needs to understand diabetes is because it has implications for every clinical arena, right? Anesthesiologists need to understand it. Surgeons need to understand it. Neurologists need to understand it because the manifestations of other conditions changes when you have diabetes underneath. The same is true of IBD. So if you're an oncologist, you better be prepared to explain very complex chemotherapy options to someone with IDD because they are now living long enough to get cancer. If you are a neurologist, how are you gonna diagnose dementia in someone with Down syndrome? You better think that through. Um, and, and with that, re with that in, in mind, if I'm a primary care physician, family physician, and I'm dealing with a potential um, uh, IDD case, are there um, workflows or, or questionnaires, assessments that I could include as part of the encounter for the process to be able to capture that, you know, and, and build those around clinical standards to help kind of uh, alleviate the cultural burden of the primary care physician having to get into exceptional care diagnosis? Right. Yes, there are things, there are um, screening tools that are not dispositive, but that then can get you to a place where you, you know you need to make a diagnostic referral. Uh, sometimes just asking the question in an open, welcoming, culturally appropriate way will get you the answer you want right there. The person usually knows. Um, and, and, and so those are some options. You know, the, the, what workflows are beyond that, there are lots of sources of training, frankly, there's no lack of training resources. It's the lack of demand for them. So if you are interested in learning how to care for someone with IDD, there is a lot of resources you can pull on. What we would like to do is to, um, in other IEC work, uh, build out more of a system for peer-to-peer -peer technical assistance and support for those who are already in practice as opposed to those in training. Um, but yes, there, you know, there are best practices. It's not cookie cutter. A lot of what will make you more effective as a PCP for a patient with IDD is frankly just being a better human being, slowing down, uh, communicating in a flexible way, using plain language, offering someone different modes of communication, um, explaining things um, in, in, at a tempo, that allows them time to process, talking to them and respecting them 
and not just talking to a care partner who may, might be accompanying them, listening to what they're saying their priorities are, because I guarantee you, usually their priorities don't have anything to do with clinical guidelines. Um, and, and so, you know, it's not, a lot of it is not rocket science. Yeah, great feedback. And, and of course, you know, here in Linux Foundation Public Health, we're focused on open source and digital health tools. We've talked a bit about, you know, the open source for the, uh, uh, the algorithms and some of the, the, the data standards and framework. We have you know, other project areas such as Open 3D Foundation, others that are into AR and VR and potentially apply to digital therapeutics. Um, do you envision that there may be tools we could look at, whether they be AI, uh, AI chatbot formats, AR, VR type tools that could assist people in an IDD circumstance with their communications or, or their ability to manage in, in the, as they face numerous instances with a population that is not sensitive to IDD communications? Absolutely. There, there are already quite a number of um, interesting companies that are trying to provide, um, you know, it's B to C or B to B tools. Um, and we are, we are particularly enamored of several of them just because of our focus areas. But absolutely, um, tools for self-help, uh, tools to access services more easily. One of the things, one of the gaps um, that we are really excited to see companies stepping into is ways to provide that digital snapshot of a person with complex clinical needs so that one, it's not an EMR. You don't have to go digging for what's important. And two, it's, um, it's user-friendly and all in one place. So if you're a clinician, think of this as you know, an on-service note, right? When you're in the hospital, you're shifting rotations, you're moving, you're picking up a whole new set of patients. In their chart is an on-service note. The chart might be 80 pages thick, but this on-service note is one page and it tells you the most important things. If you could capture that digitally, maybe you could even include, say, a video of what that person looks like at baseline, right? And, and simple tap features that tell you, here are their triggers, and when they get triggered and are agitated, here are the best strategies. Um, we once asked an ED doc what, what he would do if someone gave him something like that, and he said, I would hug them. Yeah, great feedback, excellent. Um, uh, we do have a question from the audience with regards to whether or not, as we get into some of these machine learning tools and and better diagnosis and kind of that gap as you were just describing now for that one page clinical summary or that essentially kind of an, an IPS type model for an individual in IDD. Do, do you see that working towards obviously like we have a national cancer registry, uh, could there be something like a national IDD registry that could be considered or be a value for contributing to that? I saw that question, what a fabulous idea. There are a number of small, very research-oriented, um, spe condition-specific registries now, but there is no national registry that includes all IDD conditions. And I think that's a fabulous idea and something that we would certainly want to add to our roadmap. And with that in mind, then I think we've been looking to data standards where, you know, with privacy and federated learning in mind, how that registry could contribute for any one particular instance or from a public health, population health. I love the fact that you called out Duke and, and North Carolina um, at, at the state level as a participant with our public health agencies. And we've been spending more time looking at public health, population health type issues. Obviously, you mentioned social determinants of health and how those characterize as you know complexities to clinical care, uh, which then translate into the encounter and the billing and just you know what is the state of health for our state. Uh, and it sounds like that that those standards and, and interoperability aspects could be considered. So. Yeah, you're getting me really excited because I, it just occurred to me that, you know, when we think about what you can do with the data after you've identified people, because we're so focused on the development right now, we hadn't had the luxury of doing that. But when I think about that, I think, wow, you know, the way that we're setting up the development process using individual level data, but tokenizing it mm -hmm. allows the home institution to know who those folks are, but the algorithm users don't have to. They just see a de-identified set. I think that's the best of both worlds, right? Because then the, the, 
the, the health systems that are taking care of you know who you are. They can see your data relative to other data, but your data is also contributing to um, a larger public data set in a way that protects you. I think that's the best of both worlds. Yeah, and, and just to riff off that between us, we're involved in some of the activities in California around AB 133, which is looking at data, data sharing agreements, establishing more health information exchange, perhaps a con re consent registry, but, but moreover, they're emphasizing the clinical and the social services data together. Um, and, and I think this, as you outlined it just there, fits in well with that for how from that state perspective as part of a consent registry and the, the IDD registry. So to be able to give a fuller picture, especially in those cases where it does complicate other social determinants of health, it becomes a factor of complication for housing and housing support um, or, um, or, or educational disparities and challenges there for the workforce. So. That's a great point. And one that we, it's one of those places where we, we have to really rein ourselves in because we got a lot of pressure to include you know, state data on Medicaid, state data on home and community-based services, um, employment support, unemployment support data, and school district data, right? Which could be super helpful. But we wanted to be, we knew we had to begin with a core that would be as generalizable as possible to get buy-in. And then yes, for individual entity and individual communities, that have that other richness of data to add, we'd love to do that down the road, but not as part of the core algorithm because it, it would limit its applicability. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we'll give it uh, just a minute or two more for any additional questions and I'll, I'll, I'll offer my last thoughts. What uh, my would, uh, would you like to see going forward and what can our next steps be and, and make the audience aware of this effort uh, to, to garner more participation? Um, well, we would love to come back to you when we're a little bit farther down the development path and maybe uh, share some preliminary findings um, and just get your general data science wisdom. Uh, and also, you know, I, I, I think um, we'd love to brainstorm with you about best ways for rolling this out in the marketplace um, and other partnerships that we should be thinking about. Like, I love the registry idea. Fantastic. And I lied, I'll have one more in there. Would you be interested from an international perspective? Just before this call, we were talking with the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is supported through the Gates Foundation, UNICEF, UNDP, and others for offering these sort of, of open solutions to different health complexities, largely in low and middle income countries. And of course, you know, this is yet another challenge, probably in large cases, completely undiagnosed or even to a larger proportion undiagnosed and a complexity for LMICs to deal with, if that would be a direction as well. So um, IEC is very domestically focused. We would be excited to, to support, you know, a, a sort of a side venture, that kind of international um, uh, scope expansion. I think the main challenge will be finding the social economic data, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which may not be readily available at, a, at an individual level in, uh, you know, in more impoverished countries. Um, that is the give and the, you know, the give and the take. You, um, on, on the other hand, you may not need such a sophisticated tool in a lower income country. Um, so I'd have to think that through more, but it's, it's a great point and we're very aware of the needs because, um, you know, we, a great organization for you to learn about is called the Missing Billion. If you haven't connected with them, I'm happy to make that connection. They um, are advocating for, inter for national health systems on an international level to um, focus on people with disabilities. And they do a lot of data work. So that might be a very interesting collaboration for them. Absolutely, be happy to, to take that intro and look further. Look forward to talking to you about it further. Uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions for the audience. My, this has been fantastic. I know personally, I think it's been very informative and rewarding and, and have been looking forward to your participation. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for everybody from the audience who was here and look forward to seeing you for our next webinars and most importantly, looking forward to working with IEC in the future. Terrific. Thanks so very much. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This is the conclusion for our webinar today. Oh, there's a question about hymns. And uh, Jim, we would love to do that.
Oh, fantastic. Yep. I know Dana personally and we'll be more than happy to work with her. And um, uh, uh, we have upcoming opportunities, I'm sure, for not only HIMSS webinars, but also for, for HIMSS 23 that we may be able to factor. Right. And if anyone has an in at PCORI, put in a good word. <laughs> it's under <laughs> review. <laughs> Sounds good. Great. Okay, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your involvement today. Look forward to uh, seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you, Dan. All right. And thank you, Brian.